in our past we have here the new chapter the creation of an empire that is associated with the mogal dynasty the mogal dynasty was established after the downfall of the delhi sultanate agra was the capital for them and the first battle of panipat was play was fought between ibrahim lodi and babur in 1526 that was the beginning of the mogal empire in our country this is the extension of mogal empire and at its zenith and it's covering the entire north west part of india pakistan afghanistan entire india leaving deep south and uh, north east almost all parts of india including pakistan afghanistan were in mughal empire this is an monumental building which is located in delhi what is it can you guess this is red fort built by shah jahan it is built with the red sandstone here every year on the eve of republic day and independence day the president and prime minister accept the salute offered by our defense forces and also grace the function this is built by shah jahan who was the greatest builder of medieval times this is another important monument that is religious monuments this is can you guess this is jama masjid jama masjid which is the largest mosque in our country which accommodate 1 lakh 1 lakh people at a time and it is located in delhi it is in old city this is also built by shah jahan next important monument is a tomb this is taj mahal which is located on the bank of the river yamuna which is again built by shah jahan he used the white marble to build this important monument so what we think by this big structure of uh, moguls uh, that is red fort jama masjid and taj mahal we can say that they are big builders of uh, the medieval age this is taj mahal completely with white marble located on the bank of uh, river yamuna built by shah jahan this is another important historical city Fatehpur Sikri which is located 40 km southeast of Agra towards the route of Ajmer it was built by Akbar using red sandstone and it was made as the capital of Mughal empire in 1571 in the beginning Agra was the capital the second capital was you can say the, this is Fatehpur Sikri where we have some important monuments such as Salim Chisti Darga Panch Mahal and one of the tallest gateway darwaza that is Buland Darwaza also is located here this is Fatehpur Sikri one of the influential town this is Buland Darwaza this is Salim Chisti Darga built with white marble by Akbar this is red fort built by Whom can you guess? It is located in Agra on the bank of River Yamuna. It is built by Akbar using red sandstone. This is completely red sandstone. You, this is used by this sandstone used by Akbar to build this. This is one of the important monument in Agra along with Taj Mahal. Now these are all the six important greater Mughals right from. Babur to Aurangzeb. Babur, who was the founder of the Mughal Empire in the year 1526, who ruled for four years from 1526 to 1530, made Agra as the capital. He fought three important battles. 
first important battle is Panipat one in the year 1526. Next, Panwaha battle with Rana Sangha in 1527. These are the two important battles fought by Babur, who ruled a very short time, and after that, his son Umayyun became the emperor who ruled from 1530 to 1540, again 1555 to 1556. He was badly defeated by Sher Shah, an Afghan ruler, in the year 1540 at the Battle of Kanauj and lost the empire, went to Sassanid Empire. There he took asylum. He was stayed there and later on, once again in 1555, he reoccupied the Mughal Empire and uh, re-established Mughal Empire in the year 1555 by defeating the Sher Shah's descendants. Next important king is Akbar, who ruled from 1556 to 1605. He was the greatest emperor of Mughal Empire and who is an icon of secularity, secularism. And he had uh, good relations with Rajput, Sikh Marathas and abolished the Jijia tax, which was imposed on Hindus, that is non-Muslims particularly, whoever it may be. And that's why he was said to be the greatest emperor of Mughal Empire. Next, Shah Jahan, a great builder, who built, as we have seen just now, Red Fort in Delhi, Jama Masjid in Delhi, Taj Mahal in Agra, and he is the greatest builder. Next important thing is Shah Jahan. That is next important king we have Aurangzeb, who ruled from 1658 to 1707. After that, the era of greater Mughals came to an end. Then we can see the weaker Mughals used to rule the Mughal Empire till 1857. But what happened in 1857? The last Mughal Emperor Bahadur Shah was captured and sent to Rangoon, where he was executed in the year 1862. Thereafter, Mughal era came to an end. So we have seen that the Mughal Empire directly went in the hands of the British after 1862 permanently. These are the some important capitals of Mughal Empire. First capital is Agra. Agra is in located in UP, where we have important monuments like Taj Mahal, Red Fort of Agra. Next important capital is Fatehpur Sikri, which was built by Akbar in 1571. It was the capital from 1571 to 1585. The next important capital is Lahore. Lahore is located in Pakistan, which was the capital from 1585 onwards to 1598. From 1598 Delhi, Agra once again became the capital. Then after Agra, then we can see that Delhi is the capital from 1648 to till the death of Bahadur Shah to that is Bahadur Shah Jafar. These are the capitals of Mughals that we have to remember. Mughals were descendants of two great lineages of rulers. From their mother's sides, they were descendants of Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan as he is the greatest nomadic ruler who died in 1227, ruler of Mongol. And then from their mother's side, they have blunt relations with the Genghis Khan. Mongols are the tribal people who lived in China and Central Asia. Then from their father's side, they were the success of, uh, successors of Timur, who died in 1404, the ruler of Iran, Iraq and modern day Turkey. However, the Mughals did not like to be called Mughal or Mongol because this was because Genghis Khan's memory was associated with the massacre of innumerable people all around the world. That's why what happened, they did not call themselves as Mughal or Mongol. On the other hand, the Mughal were proud of their Taimurid ancestry, not least of all because their great ancestors had captured Delhi in 1398. Taimur captured Delhi in 1398. That's why they would like to prefer to tell that they are Taimurid ancestors. And their ancestry is Taimur. They are the descendants of Taimur. But they did not openly say that they are the descendants of Mongol or Mughals and or Chinese Khan. That's what we have to notice here. Thank mm -hmm. you.
This is Mughal military campaign. If you just see the Mughal, Mughal military campaign started from Babur, from 1526 to onwards till 1707. Babur, who was the first Mughal emperor, succeeded to the throne of the Farg Ghana in 1494, which is located in Central Asia when he was only 12 years of old. He was forced to leave his ancestral throne due to the invasion of another Mughal group, Mongol group, the Uzbeks. So he could not withstand with the Uzbeks. He left his homeland and after years of wandering, yeah. he seized Kabul. Kabul is located in Afghanistan in the year 1504. Kabul today is the capital of Afghanistan. So he set foot on Kabul in the year 1504. In 1526, he defeated the Sultan of Delhi, that is Ibrahim Lodi, who was the last Sultan of Lodhi dynasty of Delhi Sultanate in the, in the Battle of Panipat. In 1527, he defeated Rana Sangha, the Rajput rulers and uh, allies at Kandwaha near Agra. In 1528, he defeated Rajputs at Chanderi. So he established control over Agra and Delhi before his death in 1530. Then this is the scene of the uh, first battle of Panipati, which was fought between Babur and then Ibrahim Lodi in the year 1526 at a place called Panipati, which is located in Haryana. In this battle, Ibrahim Lodi was badly defeated and Akbar was, Babar was able to establish the Mughal Empire. This is second battle of Panipati, which was fought between. This next in 1527, he defeated Rana Sangha. Rana Sangha at the battle called Kandwaha. Kandwaha, which is very close to Agra, which is southeast of Agra. Then in 1528, he defeated the Chanderi Rajputs, which is south of Agra. Both are very close to the and, uh, you can say Agra, Agra, which is the capital. Humayun, who ruled from 1530 to 1540, again 1555 to 1556, he was the son of Babur. Humayun divided his inheritance according to the will of his father. So he divided his empire among his brother. His brothers were each given a province, one one state he has given to his brothers and the ambitions of his brother Mirza Kamran weakened Humayun's cause against Afghan competitors. But one brother did not support him properly, that is Mirza Kamran, because of him he had to face a defeat in the hands of Sher Khan. Sher Khan defeated Humayun at Chausa in 1539 and in Kanoj in 1540, forcing him to flee to Iran. So this is the Sher Shah and he is the Afghan ruler in Iran, Humayun received the help of Safavid Shah. He recaptured Delhi in 1555 but died in an accident the following year in the 1556. Later on we will see this is 1540-1555. This is the empire of Shir Shah and uh, empires of Suri. Suri means uh, there is the title given to the Shir Shah and three rulers fought uh, ruled the Suri dynasty. First is Sher Shah, Adil Shah and Ismail Shah. Last Shah, Ismail Shah was defeated badly by Humayun in the 1555. Once again he recaptured his empire. This is small area which is ruled by the Afghan rulers Suri dynasty. This is what we have to remember very very well. Not a very vast empire, very small empire. They had Akbar who was the greatest ruler who ruled from 1556 to 1605. And he is Akbar. Akbar was at the age of 13 years when he became the emperor. He reign, his reign can be divided into three periods. One is 1556 to 1570. Akbar became independent of the regent Bairam Khan and other members of his domestic staff. Military campaigns were launched against the Suris and another Afghan. Afghans against the neighboring kingdoms of Malwa as well as Gondwana and suppressed the revolt of his half-brother Mirja Hakim and the Uzbeks in 1568. The Sisodia capital of Chitor was seized and in 1569 Ranagampur annexed. So if you talk about 1570-1585, military campaigns against Gujarat was followed and also campaigns in the east in Bihar, Bengal and Orissa was also there. And these campaigns were com complicated by the 1579-1580 revolt in support of Mirja Hakim. So this is our, this is the empire of uh, Akbar. 1585 to 1605 is lost a, a stage. Expansion of Akbar empire campaigns in the northwest took place 
Kandahar was seized from the Safavids and Kashmir was annexed as also Kabul. Kandahar and Kashmir and Kabul annexed after the death of Mir Jahaki. Campaigns in the Deccan started and at Birar, Khandesh and parts of Ahmedabad, Ahmad Nagar were annexed. In the last years of his reign, Akbar was distracted by the rebellion of Prince Salim, the future emperor of Angir. This is the second battle of Panipat fought by Akbar between Akbar and Hemu Vikramaditya in the year 1556 at Panipat. Again, the Akbar was able to possessed the position and then he defeated the Hemu and then you can say established the firm grip of Mughals on the Delhi. In Jahangir 1605 to 1627, the Jahangir son of Akbar and whose period is not that much, he followed the policies of Akbar and the Sisodia ruler of Mewar, Amar Singh, accepted Mughal service during his time. He is a Sisodia ruler less successful campaigns against the Sikh, the Ahoms and Ahmedabad. Ahoms are, are the tribal kings in the northeastern part of India, that is in Assam, and Ahmednagar followed. Prince Kurram, the future, that is Shah Jahan. Prince Kurram is the childhood name of Shah Jahan, the future emperor. Shah Jahan rebelled in the time of Jahangir, last year of his reign. That is, the efforts of Nur Jahan, Jahangir's wife, to marginalize him were unsuccessful because Nur Jahan did not like Shah Jahan. She wanted to trouble him, so and ultimately he was able to possess. These are some of the important uh, you can say the achievements of Jahangir in Tamudolas, uh, you can say the tomb, and uh, we have uh, the silver golden coins introduced by him. These are all we have to remember. Akbar's reign, that is 1605, this is the Akbar's empire to see and uh, this is a empire covering a major area. The Mughal traditions of succession, the Mughal did not believe in the rule of uh, pre mughal nature, the right of succession belonging to the first brother, first born child where the eldest son inherited the, his father's estate that they did not believe. Instead they followed the Mughals and a time read custom of uh, Co-personary, that is joint heirship, inheritance or a division of the empire among the all the sons of the king. That was the second important theory they adopted and whereas they did not uh, like uh, pre mughal nature theory. So that is what we have to see. This is the time over the empire. They respected the time over the empire because uh, they have, this is a time over and this is the very greatest uh, emperor of uh, Iran, Iraq and uh, Turkey and who attacked Delhi in 1398 and uh, uh, and then you can say the and uh, sorry 1498 then uh, he made wonderful achievements there and then you can say Delhi was sacred. Then Mughal relations with, our, with other rulers, how with other rulers they have the relations especially with the Rajputs and uh, and uh, as the Mughals became powerful many other rulers also joined them voluntarily the Rajputs are a good example of this. Many of the married their daughters into Mughal families and received high positions, high mansabs also, but at the same time, many Rajputs also resisted and also they did not like the Akbar and all, many other Mughal kings also. The Sisodia Rajputs refused to accept the Mughal authority for a long time. And this is Sisodia, the southern part of Rajasthan. Once defeated, however, they were honorably treated by the Mughals, given their lands, Vatan, that is lands are called Vatan in Parsi, back to uh, as assignments. Vatan Jagir given back to the Sisodia. Once again, Sisodia has become loyal to the Mughal Empire. The careful balance between defeating but not humiliating their opponents enabled the Mughals extend their influence over many kings and uh, chieftains, but it was difficult to keep this balance all the time. But sometimes they have to face trouble also. All the time they did not uh, maintain the same and uh, you can say the uh, plan. This is what you have to see. Mansabdars and Jagirdars is the next important topic in this chapter. Mansabdars, the Mughals re recruited diverse bodies of people from a small nucleus of Turkish nobles, Turanis, Turkish nobles known as Turanis, and they expanded to include Iranians, Indian Muslims, Afghans. Rajputs, Marathas and other groups also into their nobility. Those who joined Mughal service were enrolled as Mansabdars. 
Mansab means rank, Dar means holder. The term Mansabdar refers to an individual who holds a Mansab position or rank. It was a grand grading system used by the Mughals to fix one rank, salary, and military responsibilities. Rank and salary were determined by a numerical value called Jat. And the higher the Jat, the more prestigious was the noble positions in the court and the larger his salary. The Mansabdar military responsibilities required him to maintain a specified number of Sabar or cavalrymen. The Mansabdar brought his cavalrymen for review, got them registered, their horses branded and the received money to pay them as a salary. Mansabdars received the, their salaries as revenue assign, assignments called Jagir, which were somewhat like Iktas. Iktas introduced by the Delhi Sultans, but unlike Muktis, most Mansabdars did not actually reside in or administer their Jagirs. They only had rights to the revenue of their assignments, which was collected for them by their servants. They did not go, but their servants used to collect the revenue while they were serving as subedars in the Suba. Suba means state, subedar means chief minister or governor, what we can call today. In Akbar's reign, these Jagirs were carefully assessed so that their revenues were roughly equal to the salary of the Mansabda. By Aurangzeb's reign, this was no longer the case and the actual revenue collected was often less than the granted sum. There was also a huge increase in the number of Mansabdar, which meant a long wait before the received a jagi. These and other factors created a shortage in the number of jagirs. As a result, many jagirs tried to extract as much revenue as possible while they had a jagi. Aurangzeb was unable to control these developments in the last years of his service, and the peasantry therefore suffered a lot. Tremendously in the hands of the Mansabdars, Jabt and Jamindars. In most places, peasants paid taxes through the rural elites, that is, the headman, that is, Mukaddam, or the president, or the local chief time. The Mughals used to one term, Jamindars, to describe all intermediaries, whether they were local headmen of villages or powerful chief times. Akbar Revenue Minister Todermal carried out a careful survey of crop yields, prices and areas cultivated for a 10-year period in 1570-1580. On the basis of this data, tax was fixed on each crop in cash, sometime in kind also they have taken. Each province was divided, each suba was divided into revenue circles with its own schedule of revenue rates of individual crops. This revenue system was known as Jabt. It was prevalent in those areas which were where Mughal administrators could survive the land and keep very careful accounts not possible in Gujarat and Bengal. In some areas, Jamindars exercised a great deal of power. Sometimes Jamindars and peasants of the same caste allied the rebellion against Mughal authority. These peasants' revolts challenged the stability of the Mughal Empire from the end of the 17th century. Akbar's policies. Abul Fazal is in his book, The Akbar Rama, in particular, in its last volume, The Aine Akbari, described Akbar's policies in detail. So we have to have the sources of Aine Akbari, Akbar Rama, to have the Akbar policies. Abul Fazal explained that the empire was divided into provinces called Suba. Suba means state, which was governed by Subedar. Subedar means chief minister or governor who carried out both political and military functions. Each province also had a financial officer called a Divan. For the maintenance of peace and order in each province, the Subedar was supported by other officers such as the military paymaster Bakshi, the minister in charge of religious and charitable patronage Sadar, Military commander Spausdar and the town police commander Kotwal Akbar at Fatehpur Sikri during the 1570s, he started discussion on 
the Mughal Empire in the 17th century and after. The administrative and military efficiency of the Mughal Empire led to great economic and commercial prosperity. International travelers such as Manuki and uh, then Tavernier described it as a fabled land of wealth during Mughals, but the same visitors were also accounted at the state of poverty that existed side by side. Documents from the 20th year of Shah Jahan's reign inform us that the highest ranking Mansabdars were only 445 in number out of a total of 8,000. 8,000 se karke 445 mein aa gaya hai. This is one of the crises we can see in the field of Jamindari system. A small number, a mere of 5.6% of the total number of Gansadars, received 61.5% of the total estimated revenue of the empire as a salaries for Gansadars and their troopers. That is a great amount which has to spend on the, the, the Jamindar, Mansadars. The Mughal emperors and their Mansadars spent a great deal of their income on salaries and goods. The expenditure benefited the artisans and peasantry who supplied them within goods and produce. But the scale of revenue collection left very little for investment in the hands of the primary producers that is peasant and the artisans. They are called primary producers because they are producing the things from the primary sources. The poorest amongst them lived from hand to mouth and they could hardly consider investing in additional resources, tools and supplies to increase productivity. The wealthier peasantry and artisanal groups, the merchants and the bankers profited in this economic world. This is what we have to find out. This is the condition of the Mughal Empire in the 17th century and afterwards till 1857. Then thank you very much for patient hearing for everybody. Thank you.